excited to be here with you all this morning. Now, I have a special treat for you because, you know, it's the first thing in the morning, so we should certainly start with prayer. Well, um, I'm bringing my friend Matt out to do morning prayer for us. Is the microphone? Oh, you're talking to yourself. I'm talking to myself. Okay. Letter in. Tell me it's ready. It's ready. Yeah. And he's gonna give you. I mean, it's on top of the guitar. So does it work? So it doesn't hurt the guitar while you're playing. Can I sing through this? Okay. G'day, ladies. How are you? Sorry, was that good? I couldn't tell. All right then. <laughs> Can you hear that guitar? Oh, isn't that lovely? <laughs> All right. So this is a song uh, that I didn't write the lyrics to because that was Jesus and it's the Hail Mary. Um, but I thought that maybe we could use this as a prayer this morning. Uh, in intercession, uh, asking the Blessed Mother to guide us to the heart of the Father, because in Him alone will we be satisfied and will we be ultimately convinced of our own goodness and beauty, despite all the mistakes we continue to make. So maybe I'll play it through once uh, as a prayer, and then if you like, we'll play it again and you can sing it with us. Is that okay? Sing that with me, you can. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sin. Come for me, my everything. Cause I have given my heart to less, and it has left me blind and wounded. So now I'm here, ready to accept the cross and follow. you, Lord. We ask that you would open our minds and our hearts to receive your truth. Remind us of our goodness and our beauty, and do not stop telling us of these things until we finally give in and believe you. Amen. Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Mother Mary. Over this weekend, over and over, it's been said, God is, right? God is. 
And I just wonder, I mean, it would be awesome if we could bring every one of you up onto the stage and say, how would you fill in that blank? So I want you to just think for just a minute. God is what for you? God is. This morning, as we talk about the idea of who we are as women, what I want to talk about is that God is writing our story. God is writing a story for each of us, a story for each of us that is filled with things that maybe we could never imagine. But I wanted to start, if I could, by telling you a fairy tale. Did you like fairy tales when you were little? Yeah? Well, we all had our favorites. I mean, it seems like a lot of people really like the fairy tale of Frozen at this point. I don't know, but at the end of my workshop yesterday when Frozen came on and no one left the room for 10 minutes so that they could sing at the top of their lungs, I got the impression that you liked the song. But no storytelling is really done very well unless there's props. Would you agree? Yeah. So I'm going to use props. In my opinion, I think tiaras should be worn on a daily basis, but since it's not appropriate, since it's not appropriate in most circumstances, I use any other opportunity that I can. Um, the story that I would like to tell you is a story that I actually wrote. I um, was sleeping one night, and I woke up at about 2 o'clock in the morning, and this story was in my head. And I tried to go back to sleep and ignore it because I was like, it's just a stupid fairy tale. I'm going back to sleep. And I, I couldn't go back to sleep. So I got up and I wrote this story down. And at the end of the story, I was a little disappointed in how it turned out. But I want to share this story with you because God told me this story because I needed to hear this story. So I'll share it with you. Once upon a time in a land far, far away, there was a king and a queen who lived in a beautiful castle. And they had a baby daughter. They named her Beloved. Oh, they loved her. And as she grew up, they dressed her in beautiful dresses. And they taught her how to paint and how to braid her hair. And as she got older, they taught her how to ride horses and how to shoot a bow and arrow. And she ate beautiful foods and she lived in this beautiful castle. And on special occasions, she wore a tiara. Well, one day, Beloved was out walking in the woods. She was gathering flowers that she was going to take home to the queen, her mother. And she tripped and she fell and she hit her head on a rock. And when she came to, she couldn't remember who she was or where she was from. And she looked around and she got up and she began running out of the woods, afraid, trying to find anyone who might be able to tell her who she was. And she came across this old woman by a hut, piles of garbage around it. The old woman was stirring something foul-smelling in a soup pot. Beloved ran up to her and said, do you know who I am? The old woman looked at her, recognized her as the princess, but said to her, you are my servant. You live here with me. Beloved looked down at her clothes, this beautiful dress that she was in. And the old woman said, that dress does not belong to you. Let me go get your clothes. And she went over and got a pile of dirty, smelly rags and gave them to Beloved to put on. Beloved took off the beautiful princess dress that she was wearing, and she put on the dirty, smelly rags that the old woman gave her. The old woman began to give her chores. Over the next several months, Beloved's hands became calloused from the work that she did. She became malnourished from the poor, dirty soup that she was forced to eat. And more often than not, she cried herself to sleep. One day, Beloved heard a commotion at the end of the forest, and she ran over to see what was going on. She came to the edge of the forest, and she saw that it was a procession. The king and the queen were coming by. Somehow she made her way to the front of the crowd and she stood there in awe of the beauty of the king and the queen. As the king and the queen in their carriage with their beautiful white horses began to pass by the princess, the king caught her eye. 
and his face registered shock. He got a little teary-eyed, and he commanded the driver to stop. He pointed to her, and he said, you, come here. She looked around a little bit, and then she stepped forward and said, yes, your majesty. And he said, what is your name? And she said, my name is Forgotten. And he looked at her, and he said, no, it's not. Your name is Beloved. You are my daughter. You are our daughter. We lost you. We looked for you for months and months. Our hearts were broken. We couldn't find you. You belong. Do you see that castle over there on the hill? That's where you're supposed to live. You're not supposed to be dressed in those rags. You have a closet full of beautiful dresses that were made just for you. Your name is beloved. Forgotten stepped back and said, no, not, not me. Not me. I... I belong to a woman over there. In fact, I better get back before she gets angry at me. I have, I have chores to do. You, you must be mistaken. My name is forgotten. And so she sadly walked back to the old woman in the hut and spent the rest of her days living as forgotten and not as beloved. It's a fairy tale. It's just a story, but it's our story. You see, ladies, we have taken our crowns off. We have said, no, that's, that can't be me. I can't be worthy of that kind of, of love or that kind of, my name could not be, beloved. But ladies, we have forgotten because we took our crowns off. As soon as we got involved in something that we thought, God would never love me because I did that. Or as soon as we went to a place that said, I'm not beautiful. I thought what Alyssa shared last night in her testimony about not seeing herself as beautiful. And that when she encountered Jesus, that the first thing she said is, I felt beautiful. Because see, beauty, what a powerful word. I don't know if you've ever been to a makeup counter. But have you noticed that there's a lot of stuff there? I mean, there is, there is an item for every problem you ever thought you might or could potentially in the future have. I remember being 20 years old and going to a makeup counter and having the woman tell me, I would highly encourage you to begin some anti-aging products now. Like, I'm 20. I know, but you can never start too soon. You don't want to age, do you? I was like, well, I think that actually, I don't think you can control that. But <clears throat> I will say that as I have gotten older, I have purchased some of those products. <clears throat> I was working at a makeup counter at a department store, and the, people, the woman next to me worked for the Estee Lauder counter. You know what Estee Lauder is, right? One of the most famous makeup lines ever. Um, and Estee Lauder is, <clears throat> it has a huge, huge product line. And I was standing at my counter one day, bored, so I was trying on lipstick colors or something, and Estee Lauder, my friend over at Estee Lauder, came over to me after she had helped this customer who I had only worked there for a few months, and I had seen that lady several times. Well, my colleague walked over to me and said, I didn't have anything to sell her. And I was, what? She's bought everything we have. Okay, you know how many lipstick colors alone Estee Lauder has? I mean, it's a tray like this. Right? Okay, so she owns all that, and that's just lipstick. How about eyeshadow? How about foundation and powder and eyeliner and makeup and anti-aging products? And everything else, I mean, there are hundreds of products. And here this woman is standing at the Estee Lauder counter trying to find something that she can buy. For what? Really, you're gonna tell me you don't have a pink lipstick? I think you have 30. But in, it was like in that moment, I was looking at her and I thought, there's something missing there. Now, I have nothing against lipstick. I have nothing against lots of makeup items, especially concealer at 5 a.m. <laughs> <clears throat> And it's all the chaperones who are clapping extra loud. 
I, I have nothing against that. But what made me sad for her is that somehow, I think she came to the makeup counter looking for something you couldn't buy. I think she was looking for something to tell her that she was beautiful. I think she was looking for something to tell her, like, like I'm good enough, I'm pretty enough, I, I, um, people will notice me. And isn't that kind of, isn't that that tug of war that we live as women? Our world has a really small view of what beauty is, amen? Really, really small. And it's so unfortunate that when you flip through a magazine, I always crack up when um, friends of mine who are men will glance through a magazine and they're like, why does everyone look alike? And I'm like, exactly. Therein lies the issue for us as women, is that we open a magazine and everyone looks the same. Everyone's 10 feet tall and weighs five pounds. <laughs> Who can compete with that? Plus, they get airbrushed. I mean, I wish that I could walk onto stage and someone would airbrush me into perfection and I could just stand here. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Except then I'd move and you'd be like, oh, it was fake. But we don't live in an airbrushed world. And so we look at magazines or we look at, you know, movies where people have body doubles because they don't have a good butt or they don't have good feet or they don't have good hands. And so they have a body double to come in on that certain scene so that they can look like they are absolutely perfect people. Well, what's perfect? Isn't, isn't it actually true that the creativity that God uses to make each one of us, that when we look around this room, we don't see anyone who looks just like us? Isn't that amazing? But our world has given us this idea that we need to all look the same. That we need to all be in this small model, the small model of what beauty looks like. And, and I know that I've, I've been there. I mean, I, I was, when I was young, well, when I was in high school, I actually didn't have a body. I looked like a stick. And so I weighed 99 pounds when I graduated from high school. I, I couldn't even wear a size zero jean, but it was mostly because I really had a, no body. So it took a few years for me to actually get things that I could put in a bra. And <laughs> so, but as my body developed and as I grew older, I started looking in the mirror and saying, look at how fat I am. I mean, where's that skinny little size zero that I was when I was 17? And, and Instead of seeing it as my body is developing into a woman's body, with a little extra padding here and there, but it's a woman's body, I'm no longer a 10-year-old child, and it just happens that it took my body longer to catch up. I, I, it was hard for me not to look in the mirror and be critical, and to say, look at me. I'm not good enough. Nobody's going to like me. No guy's going to be attracted to me. Look at what I look like. I mean, and we all have those things. We all, I, I remember a girlfriend of mine when she was 16 years old. It was her birthday. And you know what she asked her mom and dad for? A nose job. At 16. They actually ended up messing it up and her nose looked weirder than before. Her nose didn't look weird before, but after they did the nose job, it was kind of tilted in a weird direction. So then she became even more insecure about what her nose looked like because she had this idea in her head of what her face should look like and how perfect. You know, I read a study that said the number one gift that high school seniors ask their parents for, do you know what it is? Boob job. The number one gift across the country, that's the gift they ask for for graduation. Interesting. Now, obviously that overwhelms you. What is beauty? Is it your jean size or your bra size or the perfection of your skin or the way you can apply makeup or the way that you can accessorize? What is it that creates beauty? What is it that creates beauty? It's God who creates beauty. And the, amen? Yes. And the way that we were made, the very way that we were created, brings something beautiful to the world. Now, we can look around and say, well, she's not as pretty as she is, 
in whose determination? The world? Because, see, we have gotten caught in that narrow view of beauty. And if we began to expand our view in the way that God sees beauty, we would have a very different perspective. A very different perspective. Because, see, God has placed beauty, innate beauty in each of us. When he made us in his image, when he made us in his image and his likeness, he made us beautiful. I'm not talking about what could be on a magazine cover. I'm talking about the beauty that woman brings to the world. Woman brings to the world a beauty that is unlike what is brought with men. I had a friend who wrote a blog once, and the title of it was Beauty is Power. And when I first read the title, I was like, whoa. But ladies, it's true. The beauty that we bring to the world is powerful. It has purpose. See, we have value, dignity, and beauty given to us by God that has a very special place in the world. I think when it comes to the idea of beauty, there's something really powerful about being able to hear the idea of beauty being destroyed for us from a man's perspective. So I'm going to invite Matt to come out and share with you for a few minutes. Hello. Thank you very much for letting me, thanks very much for letting me come in and speak to you. It's a real honor. I have four children, um, and my second child, her name is Avila. And um, Avila is one of the strangest human beings that I've ever met. <laughs> and I mean that with all affection. She comes down from her room, and I'm sitting on the couch or something. And she does this. <laughs> hey, Dad. <laughs> so, that's great, love. That's awesome. <laughs> what was that, though? Not that I, I know what it was, but you, I want you to tell me. It's a cartwheel. Yeah. It's, uh, it's good. Uh, I read The Lord of the Rings to my, my two oldest kids, six and five, yeah. And Liam follows along. Uh, you know, Tolkien likes to talk a lot about scenery, doesn't he? And so, you know, we might read eight pages, and Liam's like, so what's happening? I'm like, he's talking about trees and mountains, that's all. He's like, all right, good. <laughs> but while my son understands a lot of it, Avila, you know, she's a little younger than Liam, and so she doesn't really. And so just out of the blue, she'll say random things that have nothing to do with what we're reading. So it's as if she's listening and going, I'm not finding this very interesting. Let me think about something that is. <laughs> and uh, not, not long ago, she interrupted me, you know, and then fro Dad, what? When I do this, I can't speak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then fro <Frodo, laughs> you know, beautiful girl. Uh, I love her dearly, and I'd like to share with I'd like, why is, is that working? I want to share with you one of my deepest fears for Avila, uh, and that's that um, as she begins to, and this is, I mean this sincerely, I've thought about this and it scares me. She, you know, she's five right now. My fear for her is that as she grows older, um, certain things will happen to her, God forbid or people will say things to her that are negative, that are bad, right, that'll hurt her. Uh, and she won't really know how to deal with it at the time because she's only young. And so as she grows older, the gigantic dreams she now has as a little girl will begin to shrink, yeah? So that when she gets to your age or a little older, she's sort of lost faith in anything good, yeah? And she might say something like, whatever, those dreams that I had as a little girl, I mean, I was naive to think that anyway. And that would, that would really hurt me, I think. Uh, but I thought about this quite a lot uh, and have thought that, you know, even if my daughter were to call me, let's say 20 years from now, and let's say she had slept with more people than she could count. Let's say that she had multiple uh, abortions, that she was hooked on porn, I don't know, uh, the, you know, if she were to call me and say, Dad, would you help me? 
Yeah, what wouldn't I do? Yeah? I mean, I would do anything for her. Because her beauty and her goodness isn't dependent upon the stupid things she's done or the bad things that may have been done to her, like Tammy was saying. So what would I, I might take her out on a daddy-daughter date night again, you know? This time we wouldn't go to Burger King because that's trashy. <laughs> uh, but they do serve the little crowns, doesn't matter. You know, but I would take her and, and uh, what would I do? Well, I would try my best to tell her that she's good uh, and that she's actually beautiful. And she probably won't believe me. She'll pretend to, like many of you are pretending to agree with Tammy. She'll say, yes, 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 I know, yep. But inside, you might think, shut up. <laughs> and I mean that, I don't mean to be funny, I mean that. Because you look at your own heart and you think, look, look, I'm sorry, I'm not sexually pure, actually. And I'm not physically perfect and beautiful, actually. And I'm not, you know, in, you know, in, uh, in, intellectually sophisticated, like there's many areas of my life that are actually quite broken. And you're probably right. And if my daughter were to think that, she would be right too. But here's the thing, I don't know if her beauty does depend on those things. So when I say to her and try to convince her, Avila, you're actually bloody beautiful. Uh, and, I, and, and she might, and, I, and what do I mean? Well, I don't mean that you're not sexually broken. I don't mean that. Uh, I don't mean that you haven't lost your virginity. I don't mean that. Uh, I don't mean that you haven't made some really stupid decisions. That's not what I mean. And I don't even mean that you're physically perfect. I don't mean that, you know? So what do I mean? Well, what I mean is you have been created in the image and likeness of God, whether you like it or not. Uh, and you have the image of God imprinted on your very soul. Jesus Christ thinks you worth the price of his blood. So you can think that you're not beautiful, but who cares what you think? That's not, act well, I mean, you know what I mean. <laughs> it doesn't change the fact that you're actually beautiful, you know? Sort of like I might think that the world is flat. Well, stiff, it doesn't make it so. Uh, and so what I'd wanna do to Avila is to try and talk her back into reality, you know? And say that, well, despite what you think about yourself, there's something truer still. And that would be the very simple, very, um, it could seem shallow, but I think a really profound message that I would like to just say to you, and it's nothing new, but it's that despite what you think about yourself, okay, that, that doesn't actually determine who you are. In the words of John Paul, St. John Paul the Great, we are not the sum of our weaknesses and failures. Right? That stupid thing you did last week, this morning, right? Uh, those of you who are just, I don't know, gossipy people, that sucks, right? Those of you who are addicted to porn and uh, you keep getting told from the church it's just a guy thing and you wanna slap them, yes, right? Uh, all of this stuff doesn't equal who you are because whether you like it or not or whether you believe it or not, you actually are beautiful. And maybe you have a very superficial understanding of what beautiful is, but that's your fault. You need to learn what beautiful means, all right? I would like to close with a true story about a young girl by the name of Mary, who at the age of 12 ran away from home. She was born somewhere in Egypt and ran to the big city in Alexandria, where she became a prostitute for 17 years of her life. Now, you might be tempted to think that, well, poor old Mary, you know, she needed to survive somehow and make a living, but you'd be wrong to think that because often she would just give herself to the men for free. She said she made money by spinning flax. In her words, I had an irrepressible passion to lie in filth. So she just did it because she wanted to. One day she hears about a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and she undertook it as a sort of anti-pilgrimage. How did she pay her way? By sleeping with the pilgrims. Totally unacceptable. <laughs> she gets to Jerusalem and she lines up at this giant church where they were going to venerate, uh, kiss a relic of the true cross of Christ. Apparently they had a splinter that came from the true cross of Christ and they were going to venerate that. As she approaches the church, she's physically repulsed from the building and cannot enter. She tries this four more times and each time cannot enter. 
and then excuses herself from the line and walks into the courtyard where she sees a picture of the Blessed Mother. And Mary begins to weep as she is reminded of her incredible sin, you know. And she sort of makes this deal. <laughs> she says something to the effect of, if I can go in there and venerate that relic, I will give my life to you, Blessed Mother. And wherever you want to lead me, I will go. Mary gets back in line and kisses the relic. She comes back out and she's praying before this image of the Blessed Mother and she hears these words. Mary, when you cross the river Jordan, then I will give you the peace and the joy you have been looking for. Let's just stop there for a second because that's a rather beautiful line. You notice that Mary didn't say, I'm very disappointed in you, Mary. I mean, for goodness sake, you're not even charging people. What's wrong with you, you know? <laughs> this is a pilgrimage. This is quite unacceptable. You know, and Mary would be right to say those things. But instead, she got at the heart. She saw that Mary wasn't lying in filth because she wanted to lie in filth. She was lying in filth because she was looking for the fulfillment of all of her desire. And that's what we do every time we seek out sin. We don't seek out sin because it's bad. We seek out sin because it promises us something exciting. But as is the case with all sin, once we've done it, you never feel really good about myself, thank you, right? So we might go to pornography because it promises us something like intimacy, something like excitement, something like joy. But we get its opposite. We get isolation, we get addiction, we get frustration, and we become incredibly boring people. Mary, but Mary says, I know what you've been looking for and I'm gonna tell you how to get it. It says that Mary crossed the River Jordan, she became a hermit for the rest of her life. For the first 17 years of her life there in the wilderness, she was continually tempted by thoughts to, to impurity, uh, by some of the songs that she listened to. Long story short, Mary is a canonized saint of the Catholic Church. We call her Saint Mary of Egypt. Go home and look up her story. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Blessed Mother, we entrust our hearts and our minds to you. We know that you don't judge us, you don't hate us, you're not disappointed in us. You see our desire for your Son, and you wanna redirect those desires so that we can be fulfilled and peaceful. Saint Mary of Egypt, Pray for us. Amen. So I guess the question becomes, do you want a story like Mary of Egypt? Or do you want a story like Mary, the mother of Jesus? What story do you want to be written in your life? Because we have much say about what that is. <laughs> I think one of the greatest things about Jesus coming to be present on earth is as the people that he met, when we read those stories, we can be encouraged. We can be encouraged that Jesus really saw people. I mean, just like the words that, that Mother Mary said to Mary of Egypt, in the same way, those kinds of words were shared, Jesus shared those words. In one of the Gospels, Jesus goes to a person, his name is Simon. It's not Simon Peter who was his follower and our first pope. It was a different Simon. Jesus goes to Simon's house and he's going to have dinner there. Now in the culture of that day, which is kind of odd, like I can't imagine doing this in my house, like you would be invited to go to dinner, so there would be a table, and if you were invited to go to dinner, you would come and you would sit around the table. But then around the edge of the room, there would be chairs lined up. And people from the village <clears throat> would come and sit along the side of the room. Not to eat, but just to listen to the conversation and sometimes participate in it. So at this particular dinner, people were very curious about Jesus. So Simon has these people around the table having dinner with him, Jesus being one of them. And then there's all these people around the edges of the room. Well, this one woman, and the scripture doesn't tell us even what her name was. Some scriptures tell us it was Mary. We don't know who, which Mary it was. 
But this woman comes over to Jesus and kneels down before him. And she begins to cry. And her tears run over Jesus' feet. Now in those days, you wore sandals, which were basically a piece of leather with two straps that you would tie or that you would buckle together to hold them onto your feet. And they walked, and there was no cement. So you would walk through dirt over and over and over. So your feet would be really dirty. And a lot of times when you showed up at someone's house to have dinner, the lowest servant of the home would come and wash the guest's feet. Well, at this at Simon's house, no one washed Jesus' feet. But this woman came and she knelt before him. And as she cried, her tears ran over Jesus' feet, washing them. She used her hair. She had long, beautiful hair. And she would wipe his feet with her hair. <clears throat> and then she took a jar, a jar of very precious, expensive ointment, it says in Scripture. And she broke it open and she poured it over Jesus' feet. Now Simon is sitting on the other side of the table, and he thought, if Jesus knew who this woman was, he would never let her touch him. He would know that, he is a, that she is a sinner. He must not be a prophet. This is what went through Simon's mind. And Jesus looks at him and says, I have a question for you, Simon. Two people owed someone a great deal of money. One owed a little bit, and one owed a whole lot. And the person who was owed the money to forgave both their debts. Which one do you think would be more grateful? And Simon said, well, probably the person who owed more. And Jesus said, you're right. He said, Simon, I came into your home, and you did not offer to wash my feet. Yet this woman has been using her tears to wash my feet since I came in the door. You did not anoint my head with oil. It was often a tradition to anoint special guests with oil on their head as a sign of respect. Yet she has poured oil over my feet. You did not offer me a towel to wipe my hands or to wipe my feet. Yet she has used her hair to wipe my feet. You see, he who has been forgiven much loves much. He's been forgiven little, loves little. See, Jesus saw her. Yeah, she was a sinner. She was obviously a well-known sinner for Simon to have known that she was a sinner. Can you put that, the pictures up? I just have a couple pictures of the, the image of, of Mary washing Jesus' feet. I, the idea of how humbling it had to be. Because remember, it's not just the table. It's not like she's hiding behind the table, washing his feet kind of under the table where no one can see. The room is filled with people. There's people all around the room watching this happening. And she knows that the people in that room know what kind of person that she is. And it doesn't say why she's a sinner, but obviously it was some kind of public knowledge that Simon knew that she was a, quote, sinner. But see, Jesus saw her. He saw her. And the last line of that story is that he looks at her and he says, your faith has saved you. Go and sin no more. Your faith has saved you. He didn't look at her and say, are you really, really sorry? Do you promise you'll never, ever do that again? I mean, just like Mary didn't say to Mary of Egypt, I'm very disappointed in you. Jesus didn't say that either. I mean, he looked at her with love. And I think what's beautiful about that story is that he saw the inherent beauty that was in her. He saw her for who she was made to be, not for the actions that she had done or not done, not for the things that she had chosen to do or not chosen to do, not for the things that she had thought or not thought, not for her involvement in church or her lack of involvement in church. No, Jesus saw her as a woman of dignity. The rest of the community did not see that, but Jesus did. And if, if nothing else, the stories of Jesus' encounters with people here on earth should encourage us that that is the way our God looks at us. It's like my story. I mean, God the Father is our king, and he looks at us and says, you are not forgotten. Your name is beloved. You are meant to live in freedom. You are meant to live in a castle of freedom. And it's not about wearing princess gowns, okay? 
or tiaras every day, although I'm not opposed. It's not about whether you like to wear ruffles or converse. It, it, it's about the fact that you have inherent beauty and dignity because you're made in the image and the likeness of God, and nothing can change that. It's as if, it's as if you could take, have you ever seen a cattle? I don't know why I'm thinking of this. It's kind of weird. Have you ever seen a cow be branded? It's gross, okay? But they take a metal thing that has the logo of whatever their, their ranch is, and they make it burning hot, and then they brand the back end of the cow, and it sears into their skin. And no matter how many years go by, no matter how much fur they grow over it, it ne that never goes away. That brand remains. It's like God branded us when he made us. He imprinted his impression upon us. His image is imprinted upon us, and there's nothing we can do. There's no clothes we can put on or take off that will ever change that brand that is upon our very being. That, that if nothing else, I don't know where you're at. I, I, I really hope that as we're here on Sunday morning that many of you who, who felt that you were just a mess when you got here, that you've gone to confession, that you found some freedom this weekend. But I, I know that some of you are afraid to go home, afraid of what's there and what you have to deal with. I'm going to talk more about that later. But right now what I want you to just hear is that there's nothing you can do, nothing you can choose or not choose, nothing that will change the inherent dignity that you hold the value that you hold. And I believe that when we really begin to understand that about ourselves, that when we see ourselves as women of value, as women of worth, as women who have purpose put into us by a God who loves us so passionately, that he was so phenomenally creative in the way that he made us, that if we begin to see with new eyes the beauty that we hold as women, I believe we begin to be free. I believe we begin to find freedom like nothing we've ever experienced before. See, God doesn't want us to be trapped by insecurity, by addictions, by fear, by bitterness, by anger, by hatred of self or hatred of others, by abusive behaviors in the way that we treat ourselves. And the list can go on and on. God doesn't want us to live there. He wants us to live in freedom. In Galatians it says, for freedom Christ set us free. Therefore, don't be yoked again to the sin of slavery, the slavery of sin. Now, what did Brian say on Friday night? What sin? It's stepping away from what God has for us. Sin basically means missing the mark. Sin takes me away from who I'm meant to be. Sometimes we look at sin as like, well, sin is what, <clears throat> you know, makes me go to hell. Well, yeah, in the big scheme, I suppose you could say that. But really what sin is, the reason it breaks the Father's heart, the reason that sin needs to be purged from our lives is because it takes us away from the woman we were made to be. We were made to be women of dignity, women of beauty. And when we get captured by sin, we lose sight of that. Am I right? Sin takes that away that we are no longer able to see that we hold inherent dignity. Mary at the feet of Jesus got it. In the midst of her brokenness and her sin and the mistakes that she had made, she knew that she needed to get close to Jesus because if I get close to Jesus, she thought, I'm going to find freedom. And she did. The last thing he said, your faith has saved you. Because she drew close to him. I'm sure it was embarrassing. I'm sure she was uncomfortable. But she did it anyway. So I'm going to challenge you ladies. Let's be a little bit uncomfortable. Let's be a little bit awkward. But let's really come before the Lord in these next last few minutes that we have together. And let's ask God to help us see ourselves with the right kind of eyes. So that we can have a story that celebrates who we are as women. That we can celebrate 
what it means to be his. Now I know some of you have things rolling through your head right now. Well, see, Tammy, if you knew this. Well, see, Tammy, I, I made this decision over here, and, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect me the rest of my life. Or I did this, or I didn't do this. I know some of you are thinking that. And it's like Brian said last night, there's nothing, there's nothing that he didn't die on the cross for. There's nothing too big. There's nothing too wide. Thank you.